Shalom Aleichem. It's an honor to be here. And you, you are right, Dr. Atkins, you're not a roaster. <laughs> a year ago, we came to, uh, we, we met Jay. <laughs> the first thing he said to us was, you know, you're in Hollywood, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be so, so Jewish like you are. So we made some changes. <laughs> he said, you don't want to offend the, the non-Jewish the non people the, uh, and, or the Jewish people. You know, we, we are Hasidim and we always start with the Hasidish story. There's a, a very famous story about a man that goes to his rav, to his, uh, his rabbi, his, his rabbi, but, but a real rabbi, not like from your list. <laughs> a rav. He says to his rav, rav, you'll never believe what happened to me. My son left the house and became a Christian. The rav says, shh, never believe what happened to me. My son left the house too and became a Christian. And so what do we do? The Rav said, we pray to God. They prayed to God, and God answered and said, you never believe what happened to me. <laughs> Hi, this is Jim Bredos. We're going to get started in just a few minutes, but here's part two of that Hasidic clip on the roast. He hops out of the car. <laughs> we have to find the new dentist. <laughs> Jay, Jay always wanted to, uh, to, to make us feel uh, comfortable in Los Angeles with, uh, you know, all the different things that we like for eating. We, we eat only kosher food, unlike you. And... <laughs> And we, he took us to a restaurant in uh, the, the Pico Robertson. Pico Robertson, the fancy restaurant. We don't, we don't know from fancy restaurants. We go to Ganander's Kosher Delight. We go, oh, Cafe on Lee. Cafe on Lee. Uh, you don't, never been there? So <laughs> he took us to this fancy, fancy restaurant on, on Pico. I don't remember the name of it. It was very, they want to be French. And every waiter, Dorton, had a, a, a stickle, uh, the, 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 the kind of level. He had a small spoon in his jacket pocket. So we go, and Shuldik, uh, why, what, why do you have a little small spoon like all the waiters? So he said, well, there's a very fancy restaurant, and we noticed the number one instrument that the clients keep dropping are, are the, the small spoon. So we carry a small spoon here. We were very impressed. The next waiter we saw came out from the bathroom, and he had a, an orange string coming out of his breasts. <laughs> so we said, excuse me, what's the with the orange string? He said, this is a very fancy restaurant and our owner makes sure we not only wash our hands in the bathroom, we're not allowed to touch our schmendrick, so we tie a string and pull it out with that. <laughs> I, I, I said, how do you put it back in? He said, with a small spoon, we tuck it right back inside. <laughs> Welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vredos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College for Criminal Justice here in New York City. We're doing a show today on Jewish comedy that I've wanted to do for a very, very long time. We were waiting for the right book to be written, and now it has been. And we're extremely pleased to have the author on the show today. The philosopher and social critic Kenneth Burke saw comedy in the context of social tension and struggle, a possible civilizing force toward a lessening of human conflict and the inevitable tragedies of life. In comedy, he thought we could front openly many things we hide and repress when we are serious. It's a symbol 
an art form used for communication whose goal is often to dramatize the quirks and foibles, the universal awe, wonder, insecurities, and absurdity of the human experience. Comedy can call attention to these experiences and show us that at some point we will all experience them. We need to try and laugh about it and see the need for creating humane institutions to lessen the pain. Now all societies and cultures have some sense of the comic that is handed down through the ages. Our guest on the show today is a world-class scholar who's written a brilliant book on a people and culture he knows best. The Jewish people. The Jewish people have experienced unspeakable brutality and profound hurts and traumas in their history, yet Jews have produced some of the freshest, life-affirming comedy that has touched much of humanity over the many centuries of their existence. With the insight that comedy can bring us, that we are all exposed to situations in which we act foolishly and painfully, the hope is that through our own special kind of foolishness and pain, we learn some humility and imagine the possible transformation of life in a world dominated by great tragedy. And as any good comedy, Jewish comedy speaks to themes and communicates with individuals of the particular culture it springs from. And it also communicates at times universally and eternal themes, touching us all to the mystery of life that unites us. Our guest on the show today is Jeremy Dauber. He's a professor of Yiddish literature and culture and director of the Institute for Israel and Jewish Study at Columbia University. The critically acclaimed book he's written is Jewish Comedy, A Serious History. So today, the show is imagining the world of Jewish comedy seriously. And right before we, we uh, meet Jeremy, here is Mel Brooks on the severe diet he was under, so he lived 2,000 years. Here's the 2,000-year-old man, Mel Brooks, and the diet he was on. 2,000 uh, 13 years old. I yes. What, what, very careful. What, what does your diet consist very of today? Very strict, very strict diet. Very strict diet. Very strict. Almost nothing. No starches. Mm. No starches. No starches. No, so we've got starch turns to sugar. Sugar turns to diabetes. Diabetes turns to the grave. Yeah, I see. So there are uh, starches around. No, no starches. Starches around. No, no meats, because meats are fat, and fat is cholesterol. And foul? Cholesterol. And no foul. Foul is foul. You don't eat foul. <laughs> you don't eat foul. No foul. good for you. No, no, no. You know, the chickens eat crap. <laughs> so no, there's no, there's no starches, no, no foul, no meats? No meats and no, no foul. What about uh, fish? No fish, fish iodine. Too much iodine, get a goiter, your eyes will spring out of your head. I see, so you don't want, you don't want any fish. No, no, sir. Well, then, you're, you're, then naturally you, you, you live on vegetables. No, then. fruits and vegetables are very bad. Very bad, they're very bad. They're roughage and they make a tons and tons of gas. And yeah. I have to be very careful because if I make a blues, I could blow myself out of this world. Yes, at your age, no you're No gas. Yes, I'm not right. allowed you to have gas. Very brittle. I understand that. But so what do very you Very little. So you have nothing to eat, that you've left yourself nothing to eat. Cool mountain water. Ten, de ten degrees below room temperature. Just ten degrees. And Just cool mountain and water. And that's all Just you eat? Just that. That's all you eat all that day? That and a stuffed cabbage. That's all. <laughs> that's all I eat. That's all I live on. What? The stuff? Is that allowable on your diet? Is the stuffed cabbage allowable? Who, who the hell cares if it's allowable? I love it. What, what, what am I going to live for, Father? A little mountain water? You think yeah. I'm going to stay alive? <laughs> Sir. Are you crazy? Welcome, Jeremy. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so Let's much. Let's talk about your book and your work and so much to talk about. How did you get started in this, this incredible book? Well, uh, first, you know, it's really great to be here to talk about the book, about Jewish comedy. Um, yeah. I started a long way back. I mean, I grew up in this uh, traditional Jewish household, sort of a modern Orthodox Jewish household. So I was surrounded uh, growing up with Jewish right, comedy. New York area? In the New York area, right out, right uh, in New Jersey, right out across okay. the George Washington Bridge. And, um, you know, we had sort of a lot of traditional Jewish cultural life, and because comedy is a part of every culture's life, we had mm -hmm. uh, traditional Jewish comedy as well, Jewish jokes, uh, some of the kinds of things that uh, we might have just heard in some of those clips, mm -hmm. uh, as well as growing up in the late 70s and the 80s, this was a time when 
American Jewish comedy was uh, on the big screen with Mel Brooks and Woody Allen on video cassette, and a little later on with Seinfeld. So you were getting it from all directions. Uh, and then, you know, I got to college, I got to graduate school, I became interested in this stuff in an academic way, and starting to teach it, I said, you know, this is a tradition. There's a tradition of this that goes all the way back to the Bible, it comes all the way to today. And by talking about that tradition, by studying it, I can share it with a lot of people who, you know, have particular loves and interests in one aspect of it or another from their own personalities or biographies, but, but I haven't seen how it's all put together, and that was kind of what I was trying to do in the book. Right. So you, you taught a course, it was this at Columbia now? This is a Columbia. Undergraduate right. course on comedy? On, on Jewish comedy, yeah, Jewish exactly. comedy. Yeah. And it was a large survey course? I it, mean, it was That's right. It started with the Bible, uh, so and then it mostly focused on the modern period, but it kind of went all the way through. And so that gave you an idea of how to structure the framework of this book? In some ways, are how is this book structured and, well, and framed? It's a good question. Because it's I mean, a huge amount of material over vast span of time. Yeah. So, you know, when I was when I was teaching the class, I would teach it, we have the benefit of having a long time with the students, and I, I really taught it chronologically. Right. But what I realized in writing the book was to say, well, I'm not sure whether a reading audience would like to wait till page 300 to get to Larry David. Uh, and maybe there's a way of, of telling it in a different way. And I started thinking about what people think of as Jewish comedy. And what I realized was that almost always when I talk to people about it, and when I, I've been talking to people about it for a long time, people would say, Jewish comedy is, and then they would put something after that sentence. Now, it could be different mm. things. They could mm -hmm. say, it is uh, a response to persecution, or it is about sort of juxtaposing the metaphysical with the mundane. But it's always an is. And I said, well, Jewish comedy is a both and, an and, an and. So instead yeah. of telling yeah. one story chronologically and just trying to include everything, I said, let me tell the story of each of those ises, so to speak. Those categories that you come to define. Those categories, you exactly. Have seven, is that? That's right. So the, the book has okay. seven different chapters for seven different categories. Uh, and I just mentioned two of them, but there are others as well. Uh, Jewish comedy is about uh, a, a trying to change sort of the Jewish community and move it in different ways, usually, although not always, through satire. Or Jewish comedy is about sort of witty and elusive byplay, right, intellectual comedy. That's or another category. That's another category. So there's one concern with anti-Semitism, right? Yes. Uh, okay, anti-Semitic uh, references. And then one that speaks directly to the Jewish community, sort of like this uh, Hasidic Rose a bit? A little bit like that. A little bit. It's huh? What's interesting about that clip that we saw earlier sure. on is that here is this group of individuals, these two Hasidim, excuse me, and they are sort of saying, we're kind of not like you, right? We constantly say, well, you, we do this, you guys don't do this. We do this, you don't do that. But at the same time, are also kind of combining and, and, and creating a kind of universal community by yeah, this sense yeah. of telling jokes that really are not particularly Jewish jokes, right? The jokes themselves, stripped of the Yiddish interventions, stripped of the little kind of byplay, the occasional Yiddish word, those are jokes that joke about a restaurant restroom. Mm -hmm. That right. you could tell that in a, any wide variety of contexts, absolutely, and I'm sure it has been. Right, and that gets to this question that we could talk about, which is, what makes something Jewish comedy? As a, uh, is it in that case because it's delivered by Hasidim? Is it because it has Yiddish language in it? Is it because of the intonation? Is it because it's only circulating within? Tell us, tell us, because this is a crucial question. So how do you how do you define it? Well, in the book, be because I had to kind of figure out what to include and what to exclude as a basic mm -hmm. category. I said, look, first, the comedy has to be produced by Jews. Um, okay. and so anybody, and I was very, you should excuse the expression, I was very Catholic about that, Catholic about that definition. Whatever, if anyone defined themselves as a Jew, that was fine with me. But when Robin Williams does his, a sort of... Shtick. Shtick on, a Jewish shtick. That's still not, that I doesn't... Qualify. That to me, I just said, look, you know what, we have to c draw the line somewhere. Okay. I'm going to draw okay. it here. Okay. But the other thing, which actually is e even more of a judgment call, was to say uh, things that speak to Jewish history or culture or experience. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the content of the comedy also has to be Jewish in that kind of essential or basic way. So that joke about the restroom, I don't know that I would have particularly put that in the book 
because I don't feel that it's a deeply Jewish joke hmm. under that definition. Okay. It's told in a Jewish way. Yeah, 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 yeah. I understand. Right. That's interesting. But, yeah, uh, yeah, and that yeah. was the distinction. And getting back to the first So something one, within yeah. the Jewish uh, tradition and history and, and, uh, of, of their peoplehood. Yes, that's, okay. that's exactly right. And, and, you know, in different times and places and in different creative hands, those mean very different things and those Absolutely. look very different. But, but that was the two definitions. And that was very clarifying, at least for me, to help sort of say, well, you know, Charlie Chaplin, who many people thought was Jewish, but wasn't, mm -hmm. his comedy wasn't going to be included, mm -hmm. right? But someone like uh, uh, Jerry Seinfeld, even though Seinfeld wasn't necessarily on the show particularly Jewish, there's something about that show that felt very Jewish, and yeah. part of the fun of the yeah. book was figuring out what that meant. Yeah, right, right, interesting, interesting. Uh, so what are the other, have we covered the other categories? So uh, one of them that we haven't yet covered, but fits in with the clips again, is um, that not only can Jewish comedy be kind of witty, which we talked yeah. about, but it can Word be vulgar. Vulgar, Ro right, yes. that's, the, uh, that's the next one. That it can, and, and, and Mel Brooks is the patron saint uh, of vulgarity, sort of, uh, you know, in the recent Jewish tradition, but it's a very long tradition uh, in that story as well. Um, there's Jewish comedy, uh, we talked about this very briefly, but of let's call it theology of the idea of the juxtaposition of the metaphysical and the, the everyday. Um, there's Jewish comedy of the folk, kind of regular people's comedy. You and call that disguise? And then that's the uh, final one, is that yeah. there's a comedy of kind of People disguise. of the folk, okay, a comedy of the folk. I right, see. right. So that's sort of, and that was a way okay. also of talking about a well, lot of What would be an example of that? So let's say a, a very simple one would be uh, Jewish jokes about uh, schnorrers, about Jewish beggars, yeah. right? So there's a particular kind of Jewish sensibility to what a schnorrer is that would make those jokes very different from jokes about uh, people who are just simply trying to get money from someone else, let's say. Okay. Uh, and those are, and, and what's the difference there? That was the interesting question about that particular thing. That chapter also has a good deal to do with the most long-lasting and often pernicious stereotype in Jewish uh, uh, folk culture, which is of women. Um, that very frequently in comedy, women have been the butt of the joke. They've been joked at, but they're not necessarily the creators of this comedy. Any uh, young men? Henny Youngman, for example, for right, example. right, as a, as a classic example. And so that was one of those stories. And then the final one, as you alluded to, is this question of, of what I call often a comedy of disguise, of saying, we know that something about this is Jewish. We can't quite put our finger on it. Sometimes even the comedians themselves say, mm. I feel Jewish. Um, I know that my comedy is Jewish, but I don't know why that is, or I don't know exactly how that is. Um, mm -hmm. which is very different from a lot of the comedy uh, of, let's say, earlier periods or, or certain kinds where you say, well, this is based on a Jewish text or it's about a particular Jewish personality or a Jewish job or something like that. And this so is not Jackie Mason, would not be in that category. I, no, I don't think... Where would you put him now? I, I think that... Or there's there's well, got to be some overlap, too, in all this. Yes, yeah. and, and that's absolutely right. right, so that there, right. there are always, you know, these comedians don't shoehorn themselves sure. in their creative work into these categories. But I think Jackie Mason's greatest running gag is that he is second only to Lenny Bruce in trying to distinguish between Jews and non-Jews. Uh, and, uh -huh. you know, so, well, Jews do this and non-Jews do that, and all these kinds of things. And a lot of that is about in one way or another, the history of Jewish-Gentile relations, which often boils down to a complicated response, um, which is about sort of hiding aggression uh, and, and manifesting aggression, right? And we say, well... At the oppressor. The oppressor, yeah. right? You know, oh, we are, we are better or we're smarter or we're this, right? Even if you guys are in charge, you know, we really know what's going on, right? Yeah. That is a kind of classic response of the oppressed I'm saying we have the we have the superiority in some way, even if it doesn't look like it now. Or even if they don't get it, that that makes them even more angry too. Go, the, uh, the oppressor. Can, yeah, the yeah. oppressor. So that and so it's a quite a cycle that that's perpetuated in a sense, but it's also liberating. I, I think know. I think that's right. Yeah. And you know, often this is done with, especially in in, in certain cultures, and Jews are, are one of them, with multiple languages. So again, in that clip, you know, you see them kind of dipping back into Yiddish. Right, which yeah, they can presume yeah, yeah, that a lot yeah, of the yeah. members of, the, of, the, of that audience are not going to understand. Uh, and and they, they are not particularly saying anything not so nice of, of what I could hear. It was a little hard to hear the Yiddish. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's, um, 
very frequently over time, some of the most potentially provocative or explosive anti oppressor materials was delivered in Hebrew or in Yiddish or some language that presumably the Gentiles wouldn't understand. Or a Sid Caesar routine. Or Sid Right? Yeah. Using so many different languages and, and actually gibberish. But right. is that sort of partly what he was trying to do? Maybe not right. directly at speaking to anti Semites, but. Uh, I think what's interesting about Caesar is, in, in, you know, and it was a magnificent, uh, magnificent comedian, a tremendously influential force, mm -hmm. is that here, in some ways, he's presenting himself as the kind of archetypal American, which is he's taking these languages and kind of absorbing them, but monolingually. He doesn't really understand them, and he kind yeah. of delivers them back. And everybody is in on the joke in exactly the same way. We know that he's talking double talk. He knows that we know that he's talking double talk. It's a lot of fun for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not the same as, let's say, some of these um, uh, you know, rabbinical comic moments or something like that where you say well I'm going to talk to you and one and then I'm going to say something that only people who know a couple of books will understand the reference. Yeah. Um, that's not that's as not much what, what Caesar about. was Absolutely. doing with those double talk sketches yeah. at least. Yeah. Um. There is I should we go back I think we <laughs> to the sure. Bible, yeah. right? Let's I mean there's this Okay. <laughs> so uh, book of Esther you mentioned. I mean I Bible's not particularly funny, or is it? I mean, I mean, this is, of course, the, the, the story, the narrative of, of the Jewish people. So um, where do you begin to bring that in to well, all of this? I, I think, you know, this has been one of the most fun parts for me about writing and talking about the book, because, you know, you always like to say things that are a little um, surprising to people, that people are learning. And you know, people say, oh, the Bible, is, is there comedy in the Bible? I didn't think of the Bible as funny. And, of course, the, the Bible is, in some sense, not funny... Uh, as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. It's not funny. And in, in many ways, in capital letters, it's not funny because there's a lot of examples of comedy in the Bible, particularly people who have kind of an ironic perspective. Oh, we know how the world works. And God comes down and says, you do not know how the world works. That, your kind of ironic sensibility. Cynical, is no even. Yes, uh, that's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. And right, cynical is like, you know, yeah, yeah. Right. And there's always a kind of sneer or a smirk uh -huh. or a smile on your face. And, and the Bible is about saying, no, we're about faith and wonder in God's magnificence, right? That's one part of it. And God sets you straight. God sets you straight. That. And people who are on God's side can punch down, right, using this new terminology, right, by making kind of, other, by using other kinds of comedy. Uh, this is where the, the philosophy quote at the beginning that you suggested uh, has at least some other perspective to look at, because a lot of times people use comedy to divide and not mm -hmm. just to unite. And many of the comic moments in the Bible are about people who are on God's side making fun of people who haven't gotten with the program yet. Um, and that may not be very nice comedy. We may not approve of it. But my job as a historian of this is not to, you know, is to, is to bring all of these sides in, right? Do you think much of Jewish comedy is more, is it divisive? Well, what's interesting well, about the comedy of the yeah. Bible, in the sense, is that that kind of divisive perspective is from before the destruction of the temple, it's from before the diaspora. It's when the Jews are feeling particularly triumphal. God has his house, as they would put yeah. it, uh, you know, in Jerusalem. Um, the kingdom of Israel and Judah are, are growing and expanding and they're beating all the other guys. And so all those guys are kind of, uh, you know, they're not so hubris, smart. Hubris. Hubris. And hubris is punished, of course, because that's what happens with hubris. And um, what ends up happening as a result is that Jewish comedy shifts from that to this kind of nervous and anxious black comedy of saying, well, we've still been told that we are God's chosen people. Yeah, so what's going on here? So what's going on yeah, here, right? right. right. What, what, the mystery it, and awe of the confusion. Right, how is it that we're victors yeah. if we look like we've been defeated, right? I mean, right. And, and, and that, and maybe the joke is on us. Uh -huh. And that's this sort of nervous energy that I think is characteristic of at least one major kind of Jewish comedy throughout uh, most of Jewish history. Right, the theological sort of back and forth. Yeah. And, 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 and dialoguing with the rabbi, uh, right? That's and, right. Uh, and it even has its uh, descendants in things that aren't theological at all, but people, you know, in an American Jewish context saying, you know, we're so great, we're so smart, we're so successful, and yet are we really, right? All yeah, this neurosis that... Uh, as you were saying, I was going to get to that. Where's, oh, the, yeah. where's the Jewish comic uh, talking about the Hubers in the White House? But that's <laughs> uh, 
certainly if Lenny Bruce was around, that would oh be. Oh my gosh, yeah. But let's, okay, th what about the prophetic tradition? About the, the um, speaking truth to power of the least among us, the, if you will, the, the radical revolutionary part of Jewish humor. So I think that the prophets are a wonderful group of people to talk about in this respect because yeah. the prophets are both these magnificent moral leaders uh, in many cases. I mean, many of them are prophets for social justice. And they are also very, very um, expert satirists. So really? one of their main issues, right, one of them was, for many yeah. of them was social justice, but one of them was I idol worship, right? They felt that they, they uh, had a they had a real enemy in the idolaters and idolaters or as we might call them more neutrally pagans um, had a very complicated spiritual religion right but in the prophet's eyes they satirize them as a bunch of morons who've like taken a stick you know and they say oh I'm going to bow gotten, down in front of the stick had gotten away from the true path yeah in either in they've, got, they've gotten away from the true path and that they did it because they were stupid. Right. Yeah. And okay. So don't be stu stupid. So Jews. right. So look at all the right, which is a satirist's yeah. uh, main go-to tool. Right, is to say, well, the people who disagree with my position, which is clearly and obviously correct, um, are idiots. Right. That's the, your your standard satiric model. They don't see what I see. Um, and and that the people got it, or some did. Well, some, and some didn't. A lot didn't. A lot didn't. Right, because the temple gets destroyed, and the right. massive number right. of people. Right. They, they, right. And that's all. That's why we have the phrase "prophets without honor," right? And no, yeah. you know, it's a, uh, uh, and and this is always a question with sort of satire, right? Does it succeed as entertainment? Not always, right? Does it succeed as changing anyone's mind, or is it preaching to the choir? Um, Consciousness raising, um, uh, treachery. Well, not treachery yeah. is not the word, but uh, to go against the establishment. Yeah, I mean, you know, one can ask whether or not John Stewart changed a lot of minds. Right. Right. Remarkably entertaining from my perspective, uh, uh, you know, right. very Jewish, very, right. very, but did he change minds? Right. And, and the answer to that is quite frankly, I don't know. Um, Lenny Bruce. Uh, now he changed minds and he, he literally sacrificed himself. I think uh, one of, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut No, 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 go ahead. Uh, I mean, that's sort of a Jewish thing, too, maybe. Right? Oh, yeah. Well, Bruce is, you know, incalculably influential. I mean, you know, right. here was this comedian's comedian and inspired a whole kind of comedy. I mean, every everybody who you read about Bruce who's a comedian says, you know, he inspired me to talk about myself. You know, he inspired me to put my own autobiography in. And mm -hmm. he did that by being very Jewish. He used a lot of Yiddish. He used a lot of... And, and that was, in some ways, even more than the satire, I think his most important legacy for American comedy was, you know, he, that he was someone who said, I'm not just going to do a nightclub act that uh, anybody could do my act. Only Lenny Bruce could do Lenny Bruce's act because only he was Lenny Bruce. And so how was he stuff. really political? How was he from this political uh, tradition, Jewish S revolutionary tradition, So you say? Uh, you know, I, I one of the interesting questions I talk about in the book is whether, you know, how Jewish is this liberal 50s kind of, uh, you know, starting in the 50s kind of satiric tradition. The, 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 the person who immediately predates Lenny Bruce in this, Mort Saul, you know, is, ask, is Jewish, yeah. but, right. you know, you wouldn't know it from anything that his act does. Now, you could say maybe because of his, uh, you know, his upbringing among people from the left that, 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 that and many of them were Jewish and, you know. But, but not that overtly, no. Right, and that seems, no, right. and seems very circular. I, I wouldn't want to say that only Jews or only, you know, could, could come to these positions. Of course. Um, I do think, though, that for Bruce, one of the things that he was the most interested in was um, a kind of authenticity that came hand in hand with a hipness that was associated with the left, let's say. He was very... He and the burgeoning counterculture, which disproportionately yeah. attracted young Jewish people. Right? I, think, I think that's true. I mean, you know, Bruce was always interested in playing to the band. You know, that was, that's one of the things I think that uh, made him a little bit less of a mainstream success mm -hmm. than, than he could have been. But if he had, he wouldn't have been Lenny Bruce. Right. Um, right. One of his most, I think, indicative comments one time, he said, yeah, I wasn't very funny tonight, but I'm not always funny. I'm Lenny Bruce. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is, you know, th and that was... And he got less and less funny as the charges, the legal charges, 
started piling up. Right. Uh, but that's uh, right. Became a very tragic figure in the end. Right. Of course, but I. But yeah, I agree with that, and I th but I think that most of his political satire, per se, the satire right. about uh, you know using all of these dirty words to try and uh, minimize their power, right. uh, about right, sort right, of the right. discomfort the liberals have with African Americans and these you know in the, in mm -hmm. the routine called how to talk to your colored friends at parties. Very very important. Yeah, very yeah. important uh, because blacks and Jews really form the nucleus of that civil rights movement. Right. That, but that you time. could have imagined a number of other comedians, including non-Jews delivering at least the, the second of those, the yeah. how do you do, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe, I don't know how many people would have had the nerve to do all the dirty words, right? But, right. Uh, um, and so that was the interesting question. So I ended up, for example, in talking about Bruce in the book, and he takes up a good amount of space because he's so important, right. focusing more on the stuff that was explicitly about sort of the Jewish aspects, his usage of Yiddish, his usage of this Jewish side of his personality, and of course that division of the world that he has between Jewish and Goyish, this very famous uh, Yeah, division. I was going to play on the... T uh, We'll, we'll talk about it right. when we get to that clip yet. But, so he did identify very much with his Jewish. A hundred percent. hundred percent. In a way that, again, was, you know, and what's interesting is that it was uh, mind-blowing to not only Jewish comics, but to, to everybody, everyone who was in comedy, to say, okay, well, he's expressing his Jewish truth, for lack of a better phrase. Um, I can express my... Italian American truth, or my right, African right. American truth, or what have you. But yeah. you know, it, it really did transcend those boundaries. But for him, it That's was grounded in his Jewishness. You know. That's a great. It was also a, a, a great digs at religion, right? Yes. The Berkeley concert album in which watch the Jew be charming, <laughs> or you know, the Catholics building these great monuments uh, because people don't want to come into a shithole. Right. I mean, you know, <laughs> to pray and so. But so. Yeah. Again, that poking fun yes. at the rabbinical tradition, which you point out too in the book, which a lot of people didn't quite realize, right? The poking fun of, of some of the rabbinical uh, uh, figures in the 18th, 19th century. Yes. Uh, so I, I mean, I think, you know, one of these things that sometimes from our watching of sh movies like Fiddler on the Roof or what have you is we think yeah. of this in this kind of yeah. sepia toned, kind of very calm. And there's a lot of. A ferment going on back and forth, and people got nasty, you know, and people, yeah. people use these kinds of things. Uh, and they did it for all sorts of ways. As you were saying, Bruce, I think, was in, in routines like Religions Incorporated, uh, or Religion Incorporated, was very interested in saying a lot of this stuff, Jew, Catholic, way, is like commercial showbiz phoniness <laughs> now. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not saying that that's true, I'm saying that's what he certainly said. Right. Um, you know, earlier on, a hundred years before, people who were making fun of Hasidism, for example, rabbis who were saying, these are a bunch of, you know, um, charismatic con, or con jobbers trying to dupe credulous people into giving them money and other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these things don't change because so human like nature doesn't change that much. Fundamentalist preachers, Christian preachers today would be... I, th I think everybody takes their turn in the dock, you know, to be satirists. Yeah. And, and, and as you say, I mean, I think that this was an important job um, for the satirists is to try and point these things out. Uh, and then the question is, what were sometimes, were they advocating something in its place? How did that work for them? How did that work for the society? Yeah. In other words, sort of a hidden agenda there uh, that you couldn't quite... It was yeah. more or less up to you to create it. Sometimes uh, it was. I opening mean, up the door in a sense of freedom with to question. With Bruce, you know, I think kind of, you know, it was, right. it was more, you know, with, with a lot of these satirists uh, the hundred years before, they had a very clear program um, of what they wanted to put in place. And people, it turns out, weren't so interested necessarily in the program. They didn't, you know, they didn't want to hear the advice from these guys. Uh, well, you know, we're going to move into, uh, in a couple minutes, um, a clip by Woody Allen. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, his, uh, I think it was a clip from Hannah and her sisters. Okay. And it's the final scene um, where we're left um, viewing one of the Marx Brothers shows. So right. hopefully we'll get that up here real soon. Right. Here is uh, Woody Allen and uh, Hannah and his sisters. Gosh, you really went through a crisis, you know that? H how did you get over it? I mean, when I ran into you, you seemed, you seemed just perfectly fine. Well, you seem fine now. Well, I'll tell you. One day, about a month ago, I really hit bottom. You know, I just felt that in a godless universe, I didn't want to go on living. Now, I happen to own this rifle, which I loaded, believe it or not, and pressed it to my forehead. And I remember thinking at the time, I'm going to kill myself. And then I thought, what if I'm wrong? 
what if there is a God? I mean, after all, nobody really knows that. But then I thought, no, you know, maybe is not good enough. I want certainty or nothing. And I remember very clearly the clock was ticking and I was sitting there frozen with the gun to my head debating whether to shoot. All of a sudden, the gun went off. I had been so tense, my finger had squeezed the trigger inadvertently. But I was perspiring so much, the gun had slid off my forehead and missed me. And suddenly, neighbors were, were pounding on the door, and, and I don't know, the whole scene was just pandemonium. And, you know, and I, I, I ran to the door. I, I, I didn't know what to say. You know, I was, I was embarrassed and confused, and my, my mind was racing a mile a minute. And I just knew one thing. I, I, I had to get out of that house. I had to just get out in the fresh air and, and clear my head. And I remember very clearly, I walked the streets. I walked and I walked. I, I didn't know what was going through my mind. It all seemed so violent and un unreal to me. And I wandered for a long time on the Upper West Side, you know, and it must have been hours. You know, my, my feet hurt, my head was, was pounding, and, and I had to sit down. I went into a movie house. I, I didn't know what was playing or anything. I just, I just needed a moment to gather my thoughts and, and be logical and, and put the world back into rational perspective. And I went upstairs to the balcony. And I sat down, and, you know, the movie was a, a film that I'd seen many times in my life since I was a kid, and, and I always uh, loved it. And, you know, I'm, I'm watching these people up on the screen, and I started getting hooked uh, on the film, you know? And I started to feel, how can you even think of killing yourself? I mean, isn't it so stupid? I mean, look at all the people up there on the screen, you know? They're real funny, and, and what if the worst is true? What if there's no God, and you only go around once, and that's it? Well, you know, don't you want to be part of the experience? You know, what the hell, it, it's not all a drag. And I'm thinking to myself, geez, I should stop ruining my life, searching for answers I'm never going to get, and just enjoy it while it lasts. And, you know, after, who knows? I mean, you know, maybe there is something. Nobody really knows. Yeah, I, know, I know maybe is a very slim read to hang your whole life on, but that's the best we have. And then I started to sit back, and I actually began to enjoy myself. Began to enjoy himself. Wow, there's a lot going on there, right? A lot going on. Tell yeah. us, gosh. Well, you know, I think um, while we're in a moment where we're really thinking about sort of Woody Allen's legacy and kind of the, the story of wh how, what Woody Allen's future is going to be told, how it's going to be told. Right now, I think, uh, as a historian of Jewish comedy, there's no question that Alan was incalculably influential. Um, and, and I think you're seeing a lot of that on display here. I mean, for, for one reason um, is that Alan is one of the great articulators of what it meant to be a kind of intellectual, or at least mm -hmm. someone who wanted us to think that he and we were intellectuals in making these kind of movies. He's someone who really, you know, said, let's start talking about philosophy uh, and about sort of theology and meaning. Now, very frequently, he was what I call in the book kind of doing a kind of simulacrum of intellectuality or, or, or philosophy, in that he was sort of saying, well, I don't really need to do the work of figuring all these things out. I just need to throw these buzzwords and these questions around. And all of us were uh, paying, it, you know, going to, into psychoanalysis or we're reading sort of the Taking latest Taking it very thing. seriously. Right. We can all say, oh, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what's going He's on constantly here. poking fun at that. He's constantly process. poking fun at that. And sort of, you know, in this <coughs> clip, it's a similar thing. He sort of, he, he thinks about the big questions. He raises them. And then he says, you know what? I'm just going to go play some clips from a Marx Brothers movie and I'll be happy. Right. It's maybe all we have. It's maybe all we have. Live and laugh at it all. Right. And, you know, a, as a philosopher or a moral thinker, we would say that maybe that's ducking the question. But it's not fair to always say, well, you know, you need to be a philosopher or a moral thinker in your movies. Maybe, you, you, know, right. you, you know, there's something else going on. So I think that that is one of the most interesting things, I think, about all of Woody Allen's work is that on the one hand, it is designed for people who want to feel good about their sense of intellectuality and their wit. Um, and on the other hand, it doesn't ask as much of us as we might think that it does. It's more about name-checking. Uh, as you know, some of the Upper West Siders uh, 
New Yorkers uh, I think are pretty adept at, at yeah, yeah, and he came but out of this this the setting right where they yeah, were with yeah. Mike Nichols and Elaine May who were doing very right. similar kinds right, of right, things. Right. Um, and and to his to, to be fair to Alan, he never says I want to be an intellectual. I want to make movies that that answer these questions rigorously. That's right. not that's not no his, no of course. His and aim, he, yeah. I mean he admits he he dropped out after one year at NYU <laughs> as a philosophy major. He, what did he he looked inside his fellow students' soul and cheated. We got caught cheating or something. That's right. He cheated right. on his metaphysics exam. Yeah, by yeah, 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 yeah. The, the reference to the Marx Brothers. Yeah. Well, one of the what's the what's central about them? That anarchists, right? I mean, so this right. he's going into the movie theater <laughs> to gain some meaning in life and some structure and framework, and here he is right with a bunch of these Jewish anarchists, right. well, comedians. What I, what I love about <laughs> uh, the, this clip is yeah. that it it actually, despite what I've said before, it sort of does answer the question, in the, in, but not maybe in a way that Alan was was expecting, in that we always think about the the Marx Brothers as agents of chaos and anarchy, right? That they come okay. in and they mess up the whole place and what have you. Okay. But of course, they're in a movie, and the movies, particularly the great ones that were done in conjunction with Thalberg and, and you know, some of these others, but also some of these others, they are shaped, and the Marx, they're shaped. They have a beginning, mm -hmm. they have a middle, mm -hmm. they have an end. The, mm -hmm. And the Marx Brothers are the assistants, assistants, they help, with mm -hmm. this kind mm -hmm. of order that's established, right? There's, there's something bad that's happened, with usually seasons. with the parts okay. that we don't pay any attention to at all the right. beginning with the ingenue. They come in, they make a whole mess, and then it all, everything all ends up all right at the end, which is... Right, which is Hollywood and the influence, is, right? Which it's, is Hollywood. It's Hollywood, okay. But, but Alan's character in the movie is looking for a sense of order. I see. Okay, so and that's maybe the best we can do here. Right, is, is um, order through art, right? Which is not the same as order through life, but at least, you right. know, you've got that. I, you know, thinking about, I mean, even the Three Stooges and all yeah. these characters. I mean, again, the chaos. They go from one, creating from one <sighs> chaotic situation to the other, and, and somehow it does work out somehow. Yeah. Most yeah. cases, right? I yeah, mean, I think that's right. I mean, you know... Um, you don't you see him dying, uh, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's not quite hits that tragic level. Um, I think that's, you know, and yeah, I'm sorry, go so on. No, 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 no I, so that again, what does, what is... Jewish comedy and comedy generally trying to accomplish here. What what is it trying to tell us at, at, at this soulful level? And you know, this is one of the most annoying things about being a professor. Yeah, is I know. that the answer I that I often give, that I, I think I have to give, anyway. is it depends. Yeah, it depends sure, on the kind. I think that you can say that different kinds of comedy have very different purposes, like we've been talking about. Yep. Some of it is uniting, some of it is dividing, some of it is elevating, and some of it is denigrating. Uh, and I think we would you know, not be honest to sort of the whole corpus that I was looking at to say that all of it was, did any one of those things. Um, sometimes the greatest works, one of my favorites, the previous book I'd written was about Shalom Aleichem, mm -hmm. uh, the writer who created uh, Tevye from Fiddler on the Roof, uh, and many of his great works of art combine a lot of these things at the same time, you know, in order for a, for a coherent effect. And I think that's the kind of work of genius, um, is that it can contain multitudes of these things, but not all of them do. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Uh, you know, uh, the New Yorker, uh, this week's New Yorker, had a brief little uh, piece on the mysteries of humor. And, and just the last paragraph here, um, we talked about the need for laughter. Well, the, this is Jack Handy, the mysteries of humor. The last paragraph. Will there ever come a time when we won't need he laughter, when we'll be sitting on soft pillows, wearing our shimmering metallic robes, drinking our soothing space tea, and perhaps one of us will reach for a piece of cheese housed in an ancient device known as a mousetrap. And the mousetrap will snap on the person's finger, and he'll let out a yowl of pain, and the rest of us won't spit the tea out of our mouths, but we'll just stare blankly. Will that time ever come? Let us hope so. <laughs> so what, what's it? So, so let us, he's hoping for an end of humor, comedy, laughter, <laughs> the, the hurt that it's <laughs> talking about, the hurt that it may inflict, <laughs> inflict. Well, I think, you know, one of these things that we very frequently do in response to a certain kind of comedy is say something like, oh, that's so bad, right? Yeah. You know, okay. you, you someone, you yeah. know, falls down and they, they are, you know, and we don't think about the, the pain, we don't think about sort of the insult of that person, you know, the whatever, right? But we just say, oh, we know we shouldn't feel good about this, but, or we shouldn't feel that it's funny, but we do feel that it's funny. Better and them, not me. Better them so and not me, right? As Mel Brooks says, <laughs> right, tragedy is when I cut my finger, I mean, is when you fall into an open sewer and die, yeah. right? Um, you know, you, see, you have these things. And I think that right now, 
we are very much in, as an American society, in a conversation about almost precisely this kind of hurtful comedy, mm -hmm. right? The, it would be uh, fruitless for a historian or a scholar to say that this has not been a part of the comic tradition. It would be, fruitful, it would be fruitless for, I think, an observer of human nature to say that we don't actually react uh, in this way. But maybe as an optimist, we could say, well, maybe we'll feel a little differently about this kind of comedy. Instead of saying, well, that's so bad, and laughing, maybe we'll say, well, you know, I actually don't think that's cool. That's not so funny, you know. And that's maybe something to be, ho that kind, at least, is something to be hoped for. Let's get into one of your all-time favorites, and mine too, Larry David, oh. Curb. And, I don't know, you want to start with the recent SNL attempt to, you know, create some sort of humor uh, and well, the Holocaust, the concentration camp. Well, I think it actually, it's a nice um, segue or a transition from what we were just talking about because it really does get to the question of what are the ethics of comedy? And I think that, you know, there is this question of when you are talking about something which has such gravity to it. Um, one question is, uh, can this be used for comedy at all? And I think yeah. uh, that the answer is that there is nothing that is off limits totally. So you're an absolute. To Anything uh, is open. Anything is open to comedy in some way, right? In so some way. So right. we so shouldn't stifle it. We just let it. Well, I, so are there I limits think at all. I, I think that you know the limits are that some things I think have to be used or you know in an appropriate way for eth what I might call ethical purposes. So, for example, Larry David, a little earlier on in his career, had done what I think is a magnificent bit of Holocaust comedy. It was on a show, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And it's where uh, uh, he invites a, a survivor to dinner. You may yeah, remember this, right? Yeah, yeah. And there's the glass eye. The glass eye, right. right, right. And then you know, <laughs> someone else brings a survivor, but that person is actually an alum of the television reality show Survivor. And, and should we know that he brought, Larry brought his friend over to... to and he wondered whether this would be helpful right. for him. He That's was right. trying to be kind. He's trying to be kind. That he could, somebody he could relate to in the, in the dinner. Right. And he asked what, uh, Cheryl, do they want to be together? Do they right. want to rest? Right. Is it awkward? Is it, yeah, is it yeah, just yeah. like, or, yeah. or is that yeah. right? Yeah. Right. And what ends up happening there, of course, is that um, they begin to sort of compare sufferings. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. the survivors say, well, you know, we didn't <laughs> have snacks. And the other guy says, snacks? I was at Auschwitz. <laughs> and I think... That you know, while certainly that was uh, that, that that raised eyebrows and perhaps more at the time, it was done I think for a purpose or it has a purpose of combating a certain kind of trivialization about the Holocaust. Saying, oh, well, Which American culture, in its trivialization of so many things, was w w so it was actually a, more of a dig at perhaps you could see it as a dig more in American culture. I think that's right. And the I think idiocy of it, the I dumbing th down of American. And I think it culture. was. I think that's exactly right. And I think as a result, and, and about sort of tr American culture and about the way it treats the Holocaust, uh, you know, calling everybody a Nazi and what have you know, mm. and that um, was something that I, I think is a perfectly legitimate use of the Holocaust uh, in comedy. The, the David routine here, I think, did not rise uh, to that level. I think it was. But, but give us maybe a, a couple more examples. The soup Nazi. This was a, a science film. He touches on this a lot, right? Nazis he, and. His, uh, whatever, the mother he, dying he, and, and or being put in a, the wrong par part of the Jewish cemetery because she had a tattoo on herself. Right. I mean, she ta he, he David talks loves yeah, the he Holocaust. Loves. There's no question he, yeah. about that. And he's, what know, do you think that's about? What's he doing there? I think for him, I think it's probably a combination. I think Larry David is, you know, he's very deeply Jewish, right? Whatever that means to him, right? And, and, right. And, and, uh, 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 but, but he is very deeply. And, and he also, like a lot of comedians uh, who are tremendously creative and gifted, want to try and deal with topics that are the mo have the highest degree of difficulty about them. And the Holocaust is a natural thing. How can I make this work? How can I make some comedy about something that is so difficult to do? To, you know, to, to make a joke where somebody falls down and hurts themselves, mm -hmm. ethics aside. It's not so difficult, right? But to do something about this, that's more difficult. That said, I think, you know, another example from, from the Seinfeld days of... of which is using the Holocaust, but not quite, was, I don't know if you remember the, the episode where Jerry makes out during Schindler's List. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, everyone yeah, is yeah. sort of, you know, deeply offended about yeah, that. And yeah. I think that that has also, it had a very interesting thing to d uh, say about the way in which we remember the Holocaust or not remember, the way we, we render some things sacrosanct when maybe they're not so sacrosanct because this is well, not the Holocaust. It's a movie that Steven Spielberg made about, you know. And it's a beautiful moment of making out and, and love. It's a connection. 
to another <laughs> human being. I mean, you could see it that way too. Right. right. And so should we be trying to, you know, talk about that as well? Right. That's whereas this horrible tragedy. Yeah. Whereas the Saturday Night Live joke was really like, I'm so venal that I would be even venal in this terrible situation. That's what it boiled down to, basically. And this is, again, you know, this is George Costanza writ large. It's sort of, well, you know, of course, George does all sorts of venal things. But I don't and, think And also he does that in the, with the, uh, the curb scene on uh, the, the episode with the Palestinian That's right. chicken thing. That's right. Uh, the pal and and the, the, a mockery of sort of the... Right. As long as he's getting laid, it's right. the Palestinian woman. She can stay or do whatever it, she wants to. That's right. right. And I think in certain ways that episode... Because and maybe because it has more length to explore it, and because those issues are more contemporary, uh, it, it becomes, it, it's a little bit more interesting of an exploration, but I agree with you. I wrote a piece for The Atlantic, and I was certainly gonna, I can't remember if it made it to the final cut, but the Palestinian chicken thing was exactly of a piece yeah, uh, yeah. With, with this same kind of issue. And, uh, I, and But the and SNL joke, yeah. Did fall somewhat flat, right? I think I thought that it did. I mean, I, I, I watched so. it and said, you know, this is not, this is not funny. It's not, it's not disturbed. Doesn't make you think. It doesn't do any of the kinds of things that you would want. Were you uncomfortable? Uh, not. I wasn't uncomfortable. I actually thought that the thing that preceded that joke, um, which was About where he noted that that what, as he said right after Weinstein, Weinstein that, that you know he uh, that that that. Weinstein was Jewish, that, uh, and remember, about I Salk and Einstein. Uh, uh, no. You know, that, right, that he wanted to see sort of Jewish positive minority, like, you know, that's this kind of, uh, in terms of this conversation, do we really need to have this conversation on national television, right? Which is the same response that people had, for example, or a similar response anyway, about Philip Roth when his first book came out, which yeah. had these pictures of Jews and say, you know, let's not air any dirty laundry. I think. And it just wasn't funny. Yeah. Maybe funny. Is that maybe that's the sin. Well, I, I, if he could have reworked it in some way to make it funnier. It, that I, I think that's different. true, although I think that what would have, you know, it's almost tautological, what would have made it funnier would have been if it did some of these things that we're talking about. That's what we w that you and I would have looked at it and said, oh, look what it's doing. It's doing something really clever right. and intelligent, and therefore Deeper. we really appreciate it. Um, you know, a... a uh, uh, there was a piece by Amy Schumer, um, which is called "The Museum of Boyfriend Wardrobe Atrocities," yeah, right? Where they yeah. and it looks just like the museum in question looks just like a Holocaust museum, and everyone reacts to it in the same way. Except that, you know, what's being shown are like when your boyfriend wears horrible clothes, Co and yeah, you can't stand him wearing that. Right. That's right. That's right. And so it's, it's not trivializing. Right. Uh, but it's it's in the it same vein of as Larry Davis trying to yeah I think operate, and something right. about this sort of the way in which it's put together as a kind of satirization of a certain kind of Holocaust museum culture rather right. than Holocaust you know the sterility of it yeah the sterility yeah. that's a great word for it yeah. it makes it very clever I think in a certain way listen you yeah. know this is an hour show but <laughs> we're gonna, just going to make it hours more but no <laughs> the, we, we've got only a couple minutes. Anything about Israeli humor? I know we need to spend more time on that, but what did you find there, so contemporary Israeli humor? You know, I think one of the, the things, Israel is a, is a country with a great uh, degree of culture in all sorts of different ways, and um, it, it, it has a culture's worth and a country's worth of comedy. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that I, you know, and so there's so much to talk about, right. one of the things that I found the most interesting about, particularly in its earlier years, um, was the way in which it tried to both say, here we are as a, as, a, as a Zionist state, here we are as a Jewish state, something that has not been around for many, many, you know. A particularistic uh, experience. Yeah, that is different from this diaspora comedy, right? Yeah. So what we don't right. want to do is we don't want to be part of the story, we want to have comedy, we want to have something that's different from the story. But of course that was impossible. Uh, and so a lot of the comedy becomes about the push and pull of how to create a culture that has that's different, but is also you know the same, um, or also continuous. Maybe I should say rather than the same. Yeah. Um, and that was some of the most interesting material. You know, something that's that's also very interesting to me is that uh, as the uh, Israel's uh, what, what is often called Mizrahi, sort of the, the the community, the community that is not from from Europe but from North Africa and from the Middle East, uh, comes into the, the the centers of creative culture. Um, how does that 
uh, and who therefore were not part of the strand of Jewish comedy that we think of from Yiddish right. theater. How does that change uh, what the models uh, The give are and take, well? the back and forth. That's exactly right. Which has right. been part of the Jewish experience. So yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's, it's apt to perhaps end on that <laughs> note. I really wish we, uh, you've got to come back. We've got to do this I'd love again. That. This was a lot you're, of fun. You're, it was a lot of fun. Uh, your book is absolutely terrific. Thank you. Jewish Comedy, A Serious History. Jeremy Dauber, thank you so thank very, you very so much. much. Thank it you. was it's a great real pleasure. And thank you all for visiting us uh, this week on the Radical Imagination. This is Jim Vretto's your host, and we'll see you again next week. Shalom Aleichem.